A few months ago, this entire space was just an abandoned lawn full of invasive weeds. But now, after amending the soil, adding irrigation and trellises, and starting all of these plants from seed, I've been able to transform this plot into a thriving organic garden. I'm Kyle from Urban Farmstead, and I've created videos to show every step in that process. But today, I just want to take you around the garden to show you a few of my favorite summer vegetables and share a few tips. This is our bean trellis. This is where I grow all of our pole beans. There are two main types of beans, right? There are bush beans, those are the low growing plants that all get one crop at once. And then pole beans like this, tall vining beans that need some sort of trellis or something like that to support them. This is a hog wire panel trellis and I have a full video on how I built this. But in this video, I just wanna show you the crops. So on this trellis, I've got two different types of beans. I've got your standard green bean and I've got purple beans. Now, these are almost identical aside from the color, of course, but the flavor, the time that you harvest them, their growing habits, they're all pretty much the same. But I love these purple ones, not only because they look cool and it's different than what you can find in the store, but they also stand out a lot on the plant. So they're harder to miss because really you don't wanna to wait too long in these beans. Once they get too large, they become very fibrous, difficult to eat. So look in here, look at all of these purple pole beans. When harvesting beans like this, there's really no harvesting them too early. See these little beans here? They're tiny, but they would be delicious. The problem is when you harvest them too late. And I'll give you an example of the time when I like to harvest them. Here is a purple pole bean that's at the perfect size. This could be cooked up, this could be pickled, great size. But here is one that's a little bit past. Now see, there's pretty much the same length almost, but this one is becoming very bulbous and what's happening there is the beans inside are starting to bulk up. Now you can still eat this, it's not like it's poisonous, but the bean is going to be very fibrous and the pod rather and the beans inside are kind of large, they're going to be bland, so it's not really good at this point to cook up and eat whole like this. You can, but I'd recommend it like this. So what I'll normally do with beans that more or less get overlooked in the garden and become this large is I'll leave them on the plant and I'll let them grow to maturity until the outside dries up. And on the inside, I'll have dry beans that can be cooked just like any other dry beans would, or I'll save them for seeds and replant them next year. Now this has like eight beans inside. That means eight of these plants for next year. And this whole trellis right now only has about 16 plants on it. So if I save two of these, I can grow this entire thing again next year. So pole beans like this grow very tall, very fast. This is a five foot tall trellis that they've outgrown, I mean, a few weeks ago, but I'll leave them on here. They'll just kind of keep toppling over and I'll pile them back up. The next crop that I grow on the same type of trellis are our cucumbers and melons. So check this thing out. This is a striped Armenian cucumber which is technically a melon, but they're called Armenian cucumbers, and we grow them, harvest them, and eat them like you would any other cucumber. This one is obviously massive, and normally I harvest them when they're about half this size, but that's one of the fun things about growing your own food is you can experiment and see how large you can grow something if you want to. Another cool thing about this is that most cucumbers, if you leave them on the plant too long, the skin will become very thick and bitter but with these Armenian cucumbers, they actually still stay pretty sweet. So the only reason I don't wanna grow all of them this size is that the seeds inside get pretty large. So like a melon, you end up scraping them out once they get this big, but it's still gonna be delicious and this thing is still growing. Now down here at the opposite end of the spectrum, I've got tiny fruits. This is a small watermelon variety. The name is Little Baby Flower. And this one's probably about halfway grown, so it's always gonna be pretty small. So it's perfect for trellising. You can trellis pretty much any melon, but larger melons might not be able to support their weight from their vines, so they could snap off. Sometimes people will make little hammocks for them to support that weight. But if you're growing small varieties, the vine should be able to support it, as long as you have a tough trellis like this to support it. I'll know that this melon's ready when I see the tendril closest to the melon start to dry up. So aside from the super large cucumber and the tiny watermelons, I'm also growing just these regular slicing cucumbers. 
and it's been a great crop this year. It seems like every couple of days I'm coming out here and getting harvests like this. Now, one of the main things that give me the ability to get harvests like this from our cucumbers is because I'm growing them on this trellis. Not only am I able to grow way more in a smaller space, but having them on this trellis increases the airflow, which reduces disease, helps with pollination, and it gets them off the ground so they're not rotting. It's really easy to work on these plants as they're up here like this. And I mean, I can grow so many more cucumbers in this little space. They're on like an 18 inch wide row, but they grow up and all my crop is up here. So trellising for cucumbers, I highly recommend it. I'm also growing some of these seedless greenhouse cucumbers. And what's unique about these is that the plants have all female flowers that are self-fruiting. So they don't require pollination from a male flower. And that's why they can be grown inside a greenhouse where there aren't pollinators. But it's not recommended to grow them outdoor because if they are visited by a pollinator, which they often are, then they will produce seeds and kind of sometimes do some wonky things. But for me, they've always been super productive. And it's nice because even if I have late pollination or bad pollination for a crop, I can always rely on some of these seedless cucumbers to give me a good harvest. These little seedless cucumbers are the best snacking cucumbers. I'll just snack on these all day long while I'm out here working in the garden. They're kind of like the cherry tomato of the cucumber world. So here's just one of the vines on this seedless greenhouse cucumber plant. Look at all of these little cucumbers. And what's so rad is that every single one of these will grow to full maturity, whether or not they get visited by a pollinator. Okay, that's enough cucumber harvesting. Let's move on to tomatillos. All right, here we are at the tomatillos, which are one of my favorite things to grow. So it always surprises me to know that not really that many people grow tomatillos, not compared to the amount of people who grow tomatoes. And I think most of the reason there is that people just don't know how to use them. So if you're not growing them because you don't know how to use them, here's what I do. Throw them on a sheet pan, either by themselves or with some peppers and some onions and some garlic, roast it in the oven, and then blend that up. You have an excellent salsa verde, or use it for a uh, green enchilada sauce, all sorts of things. They are great roasted and used in sauces. But like a tomato, you can also eat them fresh off the vine. When you're growing them at home, you can harvest them when they're fully ripe, unlike the ones that you get in the store that are not ripe yet. So homegrown tomatillos are sweet and delicious right from the vine. There's also a lot of different varieties of tomatillos, just like there are with tomatoes. I mean, there's not as many tomatillo varieties as there are tomato varieties, but look at this one. This is called a Queen of Malinalco. It's a yellow long tomatillo from Malinalco, Mexico. And I got the seeds from Baker Creek Seeds. It has sort of a tropical sweet flavor to it. And it is just delicious. I love snacking on these ones straight from the vine, but they also make a really nice salsa. Not a salsa verde, but a salsa amarillo. If you're planting tomatillos for the first time or if you're new to growing tomatillos, the most important thing to understand is that you need at least two plants in order to get pollination and actually get fruit on them. They can be two of the same variety, two different varieties, but if you only plant one, you'll get this giant plant full of flowers and have no fruit. Trust me, it took me three years before I finally learned that hard fact. I had great, big, beautiful plants, a lot of flowers, no fruit at all. But ever since I started planting more, and this year I think I've got six different plants here, I get enormous harvests all season long. That being said, the plants themselves also get pretty large. So they're similar to a tomato plant. They grow a little bit differently, but they're like a large indeterminate tomato. So you can trellis them the same way. If you like using tomato cages, which I personally don't, you could use a tomato cage. Or what I did this year is I'm using the Florida weave system just as I am with my tomato plants. So with this system, I put a stake at either end and I run string back and forth to keep them in between. And I have an entire video on how I set up our Florida weave system here for our tomatoes and tomatillos. So if you're interested in that, I'll link it right here. All right, I wanna show you our tomato plants, but before I do, I just wanna show you these amazing Queen of Malinalco tomatillos because 
They're unlike any tomatillo I've ever grown. This is my first season growing them. And not only are they beautiful, but they are so delicious. So yeah, for any of you who don't think tomatillos are like a snacking vegetable, think again and add these Queen of Malinalco to your seed list for next summer. Mm. All right, let's move on to the tomatoes. All right, tomatoes, the prize of any summer garden. Now I'm not gonna go over every single tomato variety that we're growing in this video and I won't go over all the tips about growing tomatoes in this video. That'll be a whole separate video. I do have a video though on planting our garden. So if you're interested in how I plant our tomatoes and how I initially fertilize them and everything like that, I'll add the link to that video here. But today I just wanna talk about a few of our tomatoes that we're growing and give you a few tips. So the first one here is called Principe Borghese, and this is my first time ever growing this variety. I actually found these tomatoes on the Spanish steppes in Rome, Italy. There was a little cart there selling these tomatoes. And while my wife and I were in Southern Italy this last fall, we kept seeing these tomatoes all strung together and hanging, whether they were hanging somewhere in a dark place in a restaurant or out on a patio, and they ended up in almost every meal we ate on pizzas and pastas. So what's unique about this variety is they hold really strong to their stem. They've got somewhat thick skin and they're not very watery. So what they'll do in Italy is they will string these all together and hang them in a big cluster, almost looks like a big cluster of grapes, and they'll hang them fresh and basically fresh preserving them for months. So while they're not necessarily the best tasting cherry tomato, they preserve like that very well. So that's gonna be exciting to try out this year and we're getting a great crop from these. Let's move on to the next one. All right, here we are in the next row of tomatoes. The rows are about three feet apart. The plants within those rows are about 18 inches apart. And again, I'm growing them up this Florida weave system. I like this spacing and this style a lot because as the sun comes across, these, these rows are oriented north to south. And as the sun comes across, it really shares sunlight and shade. It gets enough sunlight to create fruit and large, nice, healthy, sweet fruit, but it also provides enough shade as the sun comes across so you don't get scorching on all of the tomatoes. And those are two things people ask about. Some people say, well, doesn't that shade your plants too much? And others will say, how do you add shade to prevent scorching? And if you do rows like this, north to south, nice and tall, you'll get a really good balance of both sun and shade. But depending on where you're growing your tomatoes, you might need to create more sun or more shade. If you're growing in Arizona where it's really hot and sunny, you might need more shade. If you're growing on the coast where it's often foggy and you don't have as much sunlight and heat, you might need more sunshine. So a lot of it is about figuring out what you need for your own space. I've been growing tomatoes here in Sacramento for about seven years now, so I understand the perfect balance for our garden on sun and shade, and this works really well for us. So the next row here is beefsteak tomatoes, and the earlier crops are usually a little bit smaller, so this is not a full size. This variety is called Black Beauty. You can see it has this really dark purple, almost black color where the sun hits it, and then on the other side where the sun doesn't hit it, it just is like your standard red. This tomato is about half the size or maybe even a third of the size of some of the larger ones we'll get later in the season here, but I planted a little bit late, so most of our larger beefsteak tomatoes are still green. Let's move on to the next row. All right, this is my row of cherry tomatoes. I've got four different varieties of cherry tomatoes in this row. This one is called Favorita, and it's probably the least common variety that I grow. I get the seeds from Johnny Select Seeds. I've never seen it in a nursery as a seedling, but it's one of my favorite varieties because not only is it delicious, but it's highly productive. I snack on these things every single day and there are still tons of them in here. So Favorita tomatoes, let me go get you the other three and show you what they are. Okay, the other three cherry tomatoes, my other three favorites, Sweet 100s or Super Sweet 100s, these are a sweet, highly productive tomato. Um, I love it, it's a classic. You can find these as seedlings at most nurseries. Again, I started this one from seed. Hmm. Sun Gold is my all-time favorite cherry tomato. It's an orange, very sweet, highly productive tomato. 
This one started from seed, but again, you can find these at nurseries all the time. And the last one is black cherry. Now this is a dark purple, almost a maroon colored tomato. And they're also highly productive, pretty sweet. But what I like about this one is it has a nice level of acidity. A lot of cherry tomatoes are mostly sweet and have sort of a low acidity level. This one has a really nice balance of acid and sugar. So black cherry tomato, great one to try. All right, so to recap, my four favorite cherry tomatoes. Favorita, Sweet 100, Sun Gold, and Black Cherry. What are your favorites? Let's move on to the last row of tomatoes. Okay, the last row of tomatoes. This is the medium size, highly productive tomato row. The main variety I have growing here is called New Girl. It's a variety of Early Girl, but it's a hybridized Early Girl that is even earlier and more productive and more resistant to disease and pest. These are by far my most productive tomatoes. I mean, look at this crop. I've already harvested quite a few from here. They're not only my first tomato to mature early in spring after the cherry tomatoes, of course, but they're the only tomato that will constantly put on new crops of fruit straight through the summer heat and will produce all the way into fall and sometimes winter if we get a late frost. So they don't necessarily have the best flavor. They're not the most unique, but they're delicious as any homegrown tomato is. Highly productive, highly resistant to pests and disease. And if you just want something that's reliable, the early girl or new girl tomato is a go-to favorite. A new one that I'm trying this year is called Pink Bumblebee. This is a cool variety that's a orange and red striped tomato, kind of has like a fiery pattern on it that looks really cool, but it's also highly productive and it has a great flavor, a little bit more acidic than some of the other ones, but also has a nice sweetness to balance that. And it, I mean, I've been harvesting a lot of these so far this year. It was super early to produce, has put on some great crops. I haven't had any issues with disease yet on it. And I know it's gonna have a place in my garden for a long time, so, Pink bumblebee, a new favorite in my garden this season. Let's move on to the peppers. All right, here we are in the pepper garden and this entire bed is full of sweet peppers. By sweet pepper, I just mean any variety that doesn't have any heat or very little heat. So a bell pepper would be a very common example of a sweet pepper. And bell pepper is something that I think a lot of new gardeners grow. I know I started with planting bell peppers because it was a variety that I was familiar with. I saw it in the grocery store and I knew how to cook it. I knew what it tasted like. But over the years, as you start to grow your own crops, you realize that a lot of those things that you're seeing in the grocery store aren't necessarily grown for flavor. A lot of them are grown for shelf life. And I think that's one of the big things with bell peppers. So I started trying different varieties and eventually I found Carmen peppers, which are now my favorite sweet peppers to grow. They get, you know, about as big or as much uh, meat on them as a red bell pepper, but they have more flavor and for me they've been a lot more productive as well. So Carmen peppers are the main sweet pepper that I grow. I also like gypsy peppers, I like sweet Italian peppers, and a few others. But if you're new to growing peppers, try some different varieties other than bell pepper. I think you're going to really like them. Okay, here we are in the spicy pepper section of the garden. And for me, I like to grow a pepper with a medium heat. So I like jalapeno and Fresno chili. I think they're both very productive, have a lot of flavor, and they've got that perfect level of heat for me. I use them in salsas. I like to can hot sauce with them. I think Fresno chili make the perfect hot sauce because they make a nice red sweet pepper that has a great level of heat. But I do sometimes also grow the really hot peppers like the Carolina Reaper and the Trinidad Scorpion. I think they're fun for making like a crazy hot novelty pepper or maybe some chili powder. And a new one that I'm growing this year is actually an imposter spicy pepper. These are called habanada peppers. They're like a habanero. They have the exact same flavor profile of a habanero, but they have zero heat whatsoever. So I'm growing these habanadas and I have another heatless habanero called a roulette and I'm really, really excited for these. So even though they're in my spicy pepper section of my garden, they've got no heat at all and I can't wait to taste these ones. One thing that I do with these spicy peppers that I don't really do with the larger sweet peppers is I top prune them when they're seedlings. So basically just snip the top 
off of the pepper plant. And what that does is it encourages more lateral branching. More branching means more flowers, more fruit, and even more leaves to protect these peppers from sun scolding. So as you can see, this plant is super bushy and it's got tons of peppers on it. There's probably like 40 jalapenos just on this one plant. And a lot of that is due to the top pruning that I do early in the season. These are center cut squash and they're technically a winter squash, but you harvest them early when they're this size, like a zucchini, and you cook and eat them just like a zucchini. But if you leave them on the vine long enough, they'll continue to grow very large, also like a zucchini, and they turn into this large winter squash. So I left this one here just to see how large it would get. And look at this thing, pretty awesome. All right, this bed here is full of bush beans. So when we started way on the other end of the garden, we had pole beans, they were, you know, they're both beans, but those were growing really tall on a trellis. And as I said, they'll continue to put on crops throughout the season. These are low growing. They'll put on one main crop really. These specifically are Romano bush beans. So they're kind of a large flat variety um, from Rome. And I actually got these seeds when I was in Rome, which is pretty exciting. But unlike the pole beans, which when they're kind of this large and fat, those will be pretty fibrous. These are still really tender at this size, and I'm really excited for these. So I am doing the same thing with the other ones though, where I'm letting some of them get larger and dry out. You can see this one's kind of turning yellow. The skin is getting a little bit papery. And so I'll let almost half of these completely dry out and turn into some hard seeds. I'm gonna save them and I'll replant them next year with the rest of these. I'm gonna cook these up maybe in a paella or something like that. All right, here it is, the herb garden. Now I could spend all day talking about our little herb garden here. Even though it's not very big, there's a ton of unique herbs growing in it, like this one. This is called toothache plant. Uh, it's also called Szechuan button. It's got these little flowers, and if you eat them, they make your mouth numb. Um, I'm not gonna eat one right now because I'll just be salivating for the rest of this video. Behind it is papalo. Now this is an herb that's used in a lot of Mexican cuisine. It's often served with barbacoa and other meats and they will just put it in a jar on the table and you'll snack on it with your meal. So it's very heat tolerant and it can be used as a substitute for cilantro, but it tastes a little bit different than cilantro. Speaking of cilantro, this is cilantro. It's cilantro after it bolts, goes to flower and seed. And at this point, it's actually turning into coriander. So a lot of other countries, they just call cilantro coriander. Here in the US, we call it cilantro, but we call the seeds coriander. A lot of people don't know that that's where coriander comes from. So at this point, when it bolts, I will leave this on here rather than pulling the whole plant out as I would with some other things. And I'll wait for this coriander. I can also save this coriander and replant and get more cilantro. One thing about cilantro that not a lot of people realize is that it's actually a cool season herb. So there's some areas with mild climates where you can grow cilantro straight through summer, but here in Sacramento, it's pretty hot. So this stuff will bolt quickly. So I usually grow it in spring and fall. All right, so I won't talk about all of the herbs, but one other one that I wanna mention is basil. Now, a lot of people grow basil. There's a ton of different varieties of basil, but one mistake that people commonly make with basil is how they harvest it. Because you can, I mean, you can just start pulling off leaves however you need them and use them just like that, but you're not gonna encourage the plant to branch. So what you should be doing is pinching off the top of the basil right above two leaf nodes. See those leaf nodes right here? Those will branch out and make your plants much more bushy. So each one of those leaf nodes will create a new branch. So you get a nice full basil plant like these. See this big bushy basil plant? That thing has been pinched. You can see right here, how it initially was pinched right there, and it branched out to here, pinched again there, branched out to here, pinched again there, branched there and then pinched again there and that is how you create a nice full bushy basil plant it's pretty awesome to think that this was all just a bunch of weeds only a few months ago and now it's this thriving organic vegetable garden loaded with produce and i almost forgot to mention this is actually a temporary plot 
yeah, my plan is to create permanent raised beds and some other structures to finally have our new urban farmstead. So if you want to follow along with all of those upcoming projects, hit that subscribe button. If you enjoyed this video, give it a thumbs up. And if you have any questions about our garden or any questions about your garden, leave a comment below. Happy gardening, everyone.